Hi, everyone. My name is James Bowen, and I'm doing the Apex Football Podcast with my co-host. His name is Elliot, and he runs this Instagram, and he's a writer. His name is 24 Italia Football. Elliot, how's it going? Good. How you doing? All good. So we've been talking about soccer slash football for the past few weeks. And yep. with the Premier League kicking off and all the general leagues, especially with the Juventus tying Roma 2-2 today, yeah. um, there's plenty of football galore. And I was just wondering, you know, the first thing that caught my eye was Chelsea's result in the Premier League, 3-3 against West Brom. Yep. And what's even more humiliating is when you realize that they drew after being 3-0 down at halftime. So what do you think is the reason behind them conceding three goals despite having Thiago Silva and a brand new back line, essentially. Well, you said it. The, he, this team is brand new. This the, the club may have been founded long ago. This team was founded like six months ago. So the, the thing with this is, and this is, this I, this is something that's this, it's just different. It's like it's like a fantasy football team where you know when you do these things and uh, for Premier League or whatever, you pick all the all the best team, all the best players, all the most talented players to try to build your team so you can win against your friends. That's the essential essential of that. That's basically what Chelsea did. They took Havertz. Oh, Havertz is highly rated. Let's get him. Thiago Silva's won everything. Let's get him. Um, uh, Chilwell's very highly rated in England. Let's get him. You know, they just they bought everyone. And the thing, the problem with this is you can't buy seven players. Werner's uh, another one. Um, you can't buy seven, six, seven players, throw them into a starting lineup, and, and they click. First of all, Frank Lampard played some of his players out of position the first week. Um, of Habits, especially. Uh, right wing. Yeah. I, I thought it was ridiculous, and I, I, I like, I like Lampard. I hope it works out for him. But I thought that was. It's, it's not like it's, 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 you know, it's. You should know. So there's a couple. So there's a few things I had to that. I didn't think he should start him immediately. I thought he should have started players that he had, that had been with him at least the previous year um, more so, and then you could rotate them in. Because a lot of – when you do new signings, a lot of the times they wait a game or they come in as a sub or something like that. Um, so that, that's the main – but the main, the main thing here I think we have to, we have to recognize is that they're, they're, this team has just been pushed together. You have all this talent, and if eventually this is going to come – I think they're going to win the title eventually with this team. But the problem is they don't know each other, not on the same page, and things like that. So that's why um, Arsenal's been going through a lot of stuff over the last couple of years. I actually have more faith in them. And on paper, Chelsea's a better team, no doubt. But you, you, I have more faith in them because, you know, Aubameyang just resigned. Lacazette seems he wants to say they love playing for Arteta, and they've been there at least for six months. So this team knows each other. They know what their weakness is. They know what their strength. They're good in communication. Um and stuff like that, and they didn't just try to, to spend all that. And yes, they brought, brought some players in, but players that that fit what he's doing. So, so, so that's that's the first point I think that they're, they're playing fantasy football. And while our, while they're doing that, Arsenal is playing with players who who kind of have been around. And Chelsea just went on a spending spree, and good for them. But I'm not sure that works. And the communication wise. You don't concede three goals if you're if you're on the same page. It doesn't happen like that. If you're West Brom, you concede three. That can happen because you're not as good as the team. But if a team like Chelsea that has loaded players at all positions, the, that that specific part of it is like that's that's what happens when you you sort of build a team like this and then throw them out to the wolves, basically to eat alive. And yes, they were they were down three, they came back. But the, the, the interesting thing that I've noticed is nobody is looking at this as a good point for Chelsea even though they came back from three, nothing down. If, for example, if the, if the game today, if, if Roma was down three nil and they came back and, and got a tie against Juventus, I mean, well done, but West Brom is a team that might be relegated this season against a team that should be fighting for the title. So mm -hmm. the value of a, of, of a draws are different. That one has no value whatsoever. It might as well, it might as well have been a loss. And I just think the whole mentality of, you know, fantasy football, it, it's fun on paper. It looks nice. I like these players, but then in reality, it doesn't equate to the same value because they just threw this thing together like like it was fantasy football. And one comment I'd like to add is that Timo Werner last week said that the defenders that he was facing were like he had never faced before. They were bigger, faster, and had bigger passing ranges. And I feel like that shift between the Bundesliga and the Premier League, while it may not be symbolic of the levels at which they play, 
it's just a different atmosphere. And so mm -hmm. they haven't been adjusted to it yet. And so while I feel like Werner's a world-class player who could fit in the Chelsea system eventually, yeah. I don't think that, you know, the mistakes that he made against Liverpool, for example, um, yeah. are necessarily the, him bad. Right. Those are just adjustments that he needs to make. Right. I mean, they were bad. The, the one, he had a one-on-one -on -one and then he stopped. Like he, he came forward and then he like held back and was waiting for like, then he tried to do a dribble. When you see that play, you have to hit it immediately. And if, if you have a shocker, you have a shocker. But you have to take that shot. And, again, Werner, I didn't like the comments because I felt that the comments were out, out of spite for the Bundesliga. I don't think they he ended his time there on the best terms. So I thought the comments itself – and I, yes, the, the Premier League defenders are probably more physical – but again, the fact that he said it in that moment makes it sound like he's been there for one game. He's he already saying that that you know these these defenders are so impressive. Like, I mean, there are some big dudes in the Bundesliga. So I think it was it was more or less trying to take a swipe at the Bundesliga wall, saying the Premier League is this this league. Um, so do you, think was, do you think he was trying to justify his lack of performance at the same time by he being have, yeah. he's in a harder league? Yeah, he might have been, and I don't agree that it's a hard to leave. I, I've, I've been on this. Every all my Premier League fans know I, I, you view this. I view Premier League at best number three. So the thing is, um, with that is, is he didn't play well. First of all, he didn't play well. I mean, that's important. And then I, I just, I, I, when people come up with these statements after like one training session or one game, maybe you have a different opinion when. Like if he has 20 goals, like mid like in January, he's gonna he's gonna start he's gonna sing that the Premier League is too easy. You know what I mean? So it's just based on the how he played and the, I, I just don't like when people make those rash comments out of the gate immediately after a one game or, or one a couple of games. He needs to get be in that space longer to really know how difficult and how physical defenders are. And as we talked about before, yes as a league itself collectively, great physical defenders and all that. As individual defenders, there's just not that many that operate on that level. And you could probably argue that in the Bundesliga, individually, there are better, there, there are more high quality defenders than in, in England. And don't get me started in Italy. I could, we could spend the next 20 minutes naming defenders that give people problems in Italy. So I don't, it's, it's just like, I, I thought the timing of the comments were wrong and he potentially puts a target on his back as well by, by making that statement. But I, I, I think Werner's good, but they made, his team made the Champions League final, semifinal without him. Um, and I know he was really important, but it's just like, I don't know. I, I think his value went down a little bit in terms of what he can break. I think he's going to be fantastic in time, but I think this team is set up just backwards that it's not putting him in those his positions to, to make those moments. Also, what do you think of Kai Havertz's roller coaster season so far, where he's been on fire in one game and then not so good in these other ones? Do you think that has to do with his confidence, or do you just think there's situations that fit him better? Because the hat trick was against Barnsley, a very low level opposition. Yeah. And his lack of performance has been against also low level Premier League teams. Yeah. It's not like he faced a top five team in the world yet. That would be more justifiable. Yeah. But he's faced West Bromwich, Barnsley, and I don't know if he played the Liverpool game or not. I, I don't remember, actually. I think but, he did. I think he came on off the bench or something like that. Either way, his, his passing and all the qualities that make him redeemable and world class, or well, at least potentially in the eyes of fans, haven't been shown yet. He's actually only shown his weaknesses, if anything, like his nimbleness, mm -hmm. his insecurity on the ball. And wh whereas other players, for example, like Werner, I actually like the fact that he's getting this out of his system early on. Mm -hmm. Yes, he lost to Liverpool and he made mistakes, but he, at least you'll be able to say, all right, I'm used to this now. I know what I got to improve. With Havertz, it's like a lack of trying, which means that he doesn't know what his weaknesses are. And the faster you disclose and discover them, the faster he's able to change them. For example, like when Drogba came to the Premier League, you know, he was not hitting free kicks and not being as lethal in these certain scenarios as he eventually came to be. But once he realized how physical the league was, he started adjusting his skill sets. He already had his foundation, his bulkiness, his ability to play off the ball and be that target man. But he needed to implement other things that made him 
just that much more of an asset. And with Havertz, there are players that are not as good as him, have different builds, but are just more fine-tuned to the Premier League. Mm -hmm. He has everything he needs. He just needs to adjust. And so I feel like the more he tries, the more he'll fail, inevitably. But the more he'll grow as a player and become more adjusted. And I just feel like his age is going to play a favor for him for the, the time being. But eventually it'll be a hindrance where they'll be like, maybe he's just not mature enough for the Premier League. Maybe the move was too anticipated. Maybe he should have waited. But if he's able to break out, how old is he, 21? Maybe 22? He'll be able to. I think he just turned 21. 21. Like, people will try to pat him on the back and be like, he's only a 21 year old. Others will say he's 80 million. There's yeah. just two ways to look at it. He's just got to be able to prove both of them wrong. Right. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there, but um, I, I'm going to say this first. It was not that this was the wrong time to make this move. Um, I think this is what I always bring up with, with young players who are scoring low numbers but have lots of potential. And I bring this up all the time. He went from four to 20 goals in, in one season, right? And then there was another breakout season last year. And then now, then he left. He needed a little bit more time there. And it's it's not like, because some players, like, let's, let's I'm going to give you an example. Western McKinney. I mean, today wasn't a good game for him. But today wasn't a good game for anybody in Juventus, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna let him slide on that one. But here's here's the thing: Western McKinney plays like a Serie A player. He's played for like a Serie A player for the last three years. He transitioned to Italy so quickly, and I know it's only been two games, but you can see that that's the style of football that he's comfortable with, and he plays in what why he's having success. Harvard, okay, so Harvard is not as stylistically isn't a Premier League type of player. No, I'm not saying he can't play in the Premier League. I think he, when it was his time, he would have gone to the Premier League and he would have hit, hit it like that. So, um, so I think he can adapt to that, but I think he needed a little, a little more um, development in the Bundesliga. So it, it's, it's different when a player has this, the characteristics of a league that he's not playing in. So Western McKinney makes that jump from England to Italy. First game flawless. Havertz goes from, from the, the, the Bundesliga to Premier League, and there's all these problems out of the gate, which, which I'm not saying I don't mind. I, I'm, I don't mind Chelsea for spending the money because I think he was worth every penny. And again, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm a return on my investment kind of guy. So you can be rubbish for one season. If you get my return on my investment eventually, then I'm cool. We're good. But um, so first of all, I think it was two. I think he needed one more year. I said, I said the same thing about Pulisic, and I still, I still stand by that, even though he had a breakout year last year. Um, the problem I have with this Chelsea team is they have too many young players in the same age range. So you have Pulisic, um, you have Z Zayic, you have Mason Mont, you have Tammy Abraham, and they don't need to play the same position. When you have that many players of that age, it's going to – it's not – I'm not saying it, they can't handle it. It's not the best for a locker room. So just just uh, generally speak or a dressing room rather. Um, so it's just like one of those things. And some teams can make it work if their vocal point is around an older player. So for example, um, he was awful today, but <laughs> typically last year, if the reason Roma's young players played so well together, I'm sorry, I'm bringing up my own team. It's just the, the first example that came to my head. Jekko is the old player who is, I wouldn't say he is their franchise player. He's the star of that team. So the rest of the players on that team are, are working on developing and learning from Jekko rather than, than having um, somebody. Because then in that Chelsea team, you look around, who is that their franchise player or their, their, their game changer? They don't have one significantly. They don't have a Hazard. They don't have a Salah. They don't have a, a, a Ronaldo. They don't have a, even like a Jao Felix. So they don't have that player. Because Jao Felix is young. But his, he's the future Atletico Madrid. Everyone in that organization and that team knows that that's the case. In Chelsea, you have, you have Havertz, who's talented. You have Zayac, who's talented. You have Pulisic, who's talented. You have Werner. Who's, so there's all these talent players. But there's not a single, like, a, one, a, a, a singular piece of that team that's like, that's the star. Because I feel like when you have that superstar and you have young players, together they grow without, without problems because they, they're, they're not trying to – I guess grab the attention of the media or whatever and trying to be the guy where they're trying to position themselves to to be the next era of this club where 
when you don't have a star player like that, it, it's just difficult. And I think, first of all, I also I think Havertz is playing a little bit on a position. I like him in the attacking midfield. I don't like him on the wing. I don't like him as a false nine. I like him in the, in the attacking midfield. That's it. So it depends on what formation you play, but he played alongside, um, like underneath the attack where he could pin balls to Bailey at, at, at Leverkusen, and then he had himself and he created himself, but also at other pieces going forward that are good for, for that club. So I don't know, Chelsea, there's just, it's, I think they're a little bit of a mess. And I, again, I, I, I think this will not be the last time that this happens to them. I don't think this this particular thing's gonna happen them where they go down three three nothing or something, but they're gonna have games where they go up two nothing and and they, they end up getting two two draws. I I think there will be many points this season where the choke away leads, and the reason that's happening is and I'm not I'm not saying it's so important to have a superstar, but when you don't, then there's no identity of who that guy is. So Werner can think that's him. Mason Mott was was there last year. He can think that's him. Havertz is the most expensive. He can think that's him. So there's there's a lot of stuff here. And then there's other problems beyond that because the defenders, and again, Chilwell, I've seen him play. He's not worth half of what he's got spent. Lazari's worth like 20 million. He, I would rather have Lazari than, than Ben Chilwell. So it's just, it's just stuff like that, that this, the thing is, I still think they're too talented not to be in that situation. This could go way. This could go south early if they don't get that part of it together, because they have to identify who they are, and then they can re- re- sort of adapt to that. You know what I mean? Um, but they most certainly aren't the only Premier League team that's struggling to, you know, score goals and defend. Because today yeah. Manchester City lost five two to Leicester City, and yeah. it was at home in Etihad. Like, what do you think is going on with them? They bought what was it, Ake, for forty million? And yeah, they, they, and they just they just signed. Um, Ruben, Ruben Diaz. Diaz. Yeah. Like, why do Manchester City, is it their, I, I don't really, really understand it because if you were to put Van Dyke in that defense or, you know, even the elite defenders, that wouldn't even, you know, ridiculously change anything. It's just like this history of Manchester City not being able to defend, which is sad because they come from having company and reliable defenders, even Zabaleta to a certain extent. Yeah. So now having no real identity in the back, even Laporte, to a certain extent, as good as he's been for them, isn't like a commanding defender the way Van Dyke or Ramos are, or like reliable, this guy's not going to make mistakes kind of defender. But what do you think is going on for Manchester City? So what I, have they a, fix? I have a theory on this. And bef- I'm going to preface this, though. I think, this is just my opinion, I think Pep's the best manager of the world. I don't think it's even close. I don't think there's there's another... There's no one you can compare him against, in, like in a battle. Who's better? This guy. There's no argument for me. That's just my personal opinion, um, because I look more than the success. I look at the style of play, football, the way they control. Um, the, the, I, I think it's possible that he is trying to, because he went, he had the Bayern, the, the sorry, Barcelona, uh, Pep, Pep's football, the, the Cruyffian style, uh, and it worked there. It works to a certain extent at Bayern Munich. He got players in that system who know how to play that way, right? I don't know if um, the Man City have the right players in the midfield specifically that are fit of a Pep Guardiola Barca uh, reminiscent football. Uh, Bernardo Silva is excellent. Um, I think he's. I think he's. If he's not world class, he's knocking on the door. Um, people like that. I think Gabriel Jesus is awesome. I think he's gonna. If he ends up on a different team, he's gonna be a star. But these aren't players that work with Pep's football. And I'm not. I'm not giving him a pass because that defense is horrendous. You can't give up five goals to Leicester. Um, Leicester is a great team in England. They don't even sniff Europe in a lot of other leagues. Just personally. In Spain, maybe they could get in, but in Italy and Germany, they would have they would have so much problems just getting it like a Europa League qualifying spot. Um, so this isn't like Liverpool. If Liverpool did this to them, I'm like, that's really bad. That looks bad, but I understand it because they have Salah, Mane, and everybody else, and Thiago now. Leicester has Vardy, and that's practically it. They have other p- pieces I like. Um, I really like the center back they got from Atlanta. 
uh, they're missing him. So it's just like it's like they have good players. It's just Man City's quality, both from the financial perspective of how much money they've accumulated from these signings and the football quality perspective, it's 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 not close. So I think it's it's more about fit. Um, and th- this is partly on Pep. He's not buying players that fit the Pep way of way of football. Um, and you can see in the in the documentary of the, the the Barcelona one and the Man City one, the type of players that Pep needs. Pep is the type of guy that you're playing this style of football. You make this pass that's against the uh, psychology of his football. He takes you out. He took Henri out for miss communicating a, a play or doing something in his that he he wouldn't do. So they don't have he doesn't have that luxury because he doesn't have the players that fit. To be honest, he, they should have got Tiago because Tiago's been in that system before. Um, there's an, there's an, they're never going to get him because I don't think they're even look that way. But I think a guy like Rodrigo DePaul is someone who, who it, the way he plays football would, would um, I don't know what the word is, um, would, would sort of go with the way Pep plays. Compliment. Yeah, who compliment them. Um, I can't think of a lot of names off the top of my head because I'm just, just, I'm just thinking. Um, like minuscule, like small oh, players. Yeah, like a Pasolich. Pasolich yeah. would be, he would be a top ten player within a season if he played in pet system. The problem is you have all these really, really great, talented players who start for everyone that don't fit that style of football, and because of that, guys like Bernardo Silva and again, Barroso is great. He doesn't fit that team. Jesus is a great player. He can score goals. He doesn't fit that team either. Um, and it's, it's really hard for me to think of players in that team, especially defensively, that fit that style because, at, you know, Barcelona, he had Poole. At, at Bayern, he had uh, Botang, who at the time was, was very highly regarded. Um, and at City, you have um, Laporta, I think, is a, is a pet player. Yeah. Defensively, that's probably it. Because I think, I think the rest of the, the – the, and it's not Pep's fault. It's just like – Pep players just they're 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 not everywhere. Players who would fit that system. So I think what Pep is doing, he's trying to play the Barcelona system or the Bayern Munich system with slight modifications to try to fit his team. And it's unnatural for him to do that. And because of that, the, the players that he has doesn't don't understand that way of playing, which is why I would try to get players who know how to play that way. Um, and I'm not saying you you go out and buy all old Barcelona and Bayern Munich players, but players who can fit that because I think. Great, talented team, but I think some of the positions and the players who are in that are displaced, not because they're not great players, because they don't fit the style of football that Pep plays. Um, and again, they're, these kind of players aren't aren't everywhere, so it's hard to get in. I, Pep is going out and being aggressive, and I like that. He's spending the money. But I think the reason they struggle is because they don't have an identity as a team, where Liverpool has an identity. Even at this, at this, at this point, even Arsenal has an identity, where – it's different than Chelsea because it's not fantasy football, but it's a lot of talented players put into a system that some of them don't fit in, basically. Hmm. What about Manchester United? They, since not getting their penalties, you know, not to have any bias against them, but they did score <laughs> a lot of penalties. Yeah. It's, it's like their system. What is their identity now? They don't got one. I, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I thought about this the other day. I was um, – there was a Man United fan going, uh, doing one of those Instagram questionnaire things. And um, they didn't answer my question, but um, sort of th- this whole idea like, okay, M- Man United is still one of the biggest clubs. Okay, they're not still one of the biggest clubs in the world, but historically speaking, they're one of the biggest clubs on, on planet earth. Um, but if, if you're Jaden Sancho, why would you go there? <laughs> why? You're in Dortmund, and I, I get he wants to go somewhere. Go to Chelsea or go to Man- Manchester City. And I have, I, have, I have a very good close friend of mine who's a Manchester United fan. But the thing is, <laughs> it's just it's, it's one of those things where, where they're not making the, the common sense buys. Bronzogovic at Inter isn't – they don't want him there anymore. They should have got him a month ago. I mean, he, he's a guy who can, who can help Man United. And they're just relying on talent. I don't like the manager. And I cont- I never liked him. Um, not that I, he's, I'm, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but it just it, he doesn't have a style of football. He just puts his team out and says, "Go score." Um, 
But again, back to the Sancho thing. Why on earth would he go to a Manchester United when he has Holland, who I've been critical of, I'll, I'll be honest, um, right. and, and my critic will still be there, but against, against the first game of the season against Gladbach, I know they lost to Osberg, but Osberg is an under-radar team, so I'm not going to read too much into that. And Bayern lost, so it doesn't matter. But um, the way they played against Gladbach, who's a very well-coached, well-managed, strong team, Sancho and Holland collectively, the two of them together, just ripped them to shreds. They had Reina scored. I mean, it was just – it was a collective performance. You watch that game and you watch Sancho make this big run deep down the flank, gives it to Holland at the last second to score, basically the, the, the killing goal. And you think to yourself, you watch that, and I bet Sancho was loving that moment. And you look at and you look at that game and you think, why on earth would he even consider going there? Even if you pay $120 million, let's just say they pay the transfer fee. Why, why would he accept that move? Because it, it – it, like, just realistically speaking, it, it would make no sense for a player of his quality to do that. He can go to a Juventus. He can go to a Man City. At the, even at this point, a Chelsea and Arsenal are more – like, at, at this point in time, Arsenal is more – there's more – you can go look at that situation and say, actually, I know they're not in Champions League, but that has – I have a better chance to win with that team than this team because Greenwood is a good player. He's, he's clinical in front of goal. He does nothing else. And that's my problem with that team. Rashford, Rashford does a little bit of everything. That's the one piece you have. Martial, he doesn't excite me. Um, Bruno Fernandes, people love. I think he's good. I don't think he's great. I think he had a lot of penalties. He has good vision um, and things like that. But he's not one of those players that, like when people, when he, they bought him, they thought that this was the, the new era because they got this guy to – he was at Sporting. He wasn't at Juventus. He wasn't at AC, like one of these big teams. So I think they could finish below Spurs, even below Arsenal, below Chelsea. Even Wolves could beat up, um, you know, get in front of them. I know they, they barely beat Brighton, and I know they won late, and that's exciting for them. It's still Brighton. And then they lost to Crystal Palace when Crystal Palace was the best team for the whole game. So. I don't know. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a club, and and it's like I, I mean this in the most affectionate way, but like AC Milan is is in the right place now, but they went from glory to absolute sod all. So uh, they are they are one move away from becoming what AC Milan have been the last several years. Now they're in a they're in a better place, but during that stretch after the glory years had ended. And they were they were they weren't even even getting close to the Champions League. That very well could be Man United or Barcelona if they sell Messi. That's where they're that's the trajectory of that club is going. Where you think of AC Milan or Barcelona as this huge brand, it's awesome. And then five years pass and you don't think of that in the same way. They're they're losing, they're never gonna lose exposure, but they're losing its its value just in terms of a team because I don't know, to me, they're they're they don't have an identity. I, I just think they're a straight up disaster and until they sell, until I you know sell the club and have a new direction and get a new manager, I, I don't see this getting any better for them. It's going to be a long season for those boys. You mentioned Tottenham Hotspur. They have a very exciting new project with Gareth Bale returning. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to be his role in there? Do you think he's going to go back to the wing or is he going to play as a striker? I wouldn't play him as a striker. I don't, I don't think so. They have to understand Harry Kane's their best player. He they have to. Sort of how I, the, the argument I made with Chelsea where they need that star. They're not going to have that problem. They need to make Harry Kane the guy. He has to be – he is is the, you know, number – whatever. The, you know, those – there's historically – historical numbers, 10, 7, 9. He needs to be that guy. He need, I, I'm not saying he needs to switch his jersey or anything um, because I think he's already one of those numbers. I don't know which one, but – um. He has to, okay, that's, I wasn't sure, so I just – I went with that. But they need to embrace him. They need to make him the vocal point. Because people don't understand that he is passing ability. Maybe his best asset. Obviously, in front of goal, you give him the ball, he scores. I believe he's got more goals in the more, uh, North London Derby than some of some other, like, highly regarded historical figures. So that's their guy. You want Son to be – you want Son to feed off. He has to be your number two. And I don't. I don't know what Gareth Bale's expectations going in. If Gareth Bale is their third best player, they got a real chance at Champions League. They have to make Harry Kane and Son the vocal point, where um, 
uh, Gareth Bale's like the Chris Bosh, the Kevin Love, the whatever, you know what I mean? Um, just to make a basketball reference. So like that's that's what they need to make. They make it this player who can, who's capable of all this stuff. Get him back into a, a happy place. Maybe his attitude changes. Marino seems to re- be really key on him, but um, <clears throat> but my thing is, if you make him your third best player, you play him on the wing. Don't don't try to make him a striker. That's not what he is. Um, but I'm happy he's there and being able to um, doing. I, I still hope Arsenal finish ahead of them. But I think if you make Harry Kane the third option, then you have the best chance to make the Champions League. If you try to force him into being the starting striker or the, being the number one, then it's going to be a bad season. But if, if you use him as a, a number two, mostly a number three option, sometimes a number two on certain nights, because um, Son's going to have games where he disappears because he, that, that's typically what he does, and then he has moments. But when, if he picks up the slap for when he, his form dips a little bit, that's perfect. But if Garrett Bale needs to understand his role in this team, he needs to embrace being that number three. And again, there's 11 players on the pitch. Being a number three in soccer and basketball is not the same thing. Being a number three in, in soccer is a great thing to be. Louis, I mean, Suarez, Neymar, Messi, and it's not going to be like that. But just in terms of the way they're going to set it up, I think Mourinho really should should see him as a, as a number three guy who who will be very effective on the wing, um, feeding balls into the box because he's got a really good good cross. I think that that's not said enough. Um, and then you have guys like Harry Kane who finishes everything with also the passing ability to spread it out for the rest of the team. So. Um, it's going to be interesting, but I would I would specifically have him as the wing, and as specifically be my number three option offensively. Hmm. Going back to what you mentioned before, Bayern Munich losing after their impressive undefeated, undefeated streak since December 2019. Mm-hmm. What do you think went wrong today for Bayern Munich? Uh, I mean, it's hard to say. I felt like. They didn't, they didn't see this coming, I think. And once once they got down, they started to crumble. And they hadn't lost a game or been even tested in a game since Flick got the job. I mean, they're, they're, they're like crowning this dude the next um, Pep or the next Croy for the next something. And, and don't get me wrong, I think he's a generational coach. I think he's going to be absolutely fantastic for a long time. And I think – I don't think – this match changes whether or not the Bayern Munich are going to win the title because I think they still will. And I still think they're likely to be one of the favorites in the Champions League. But I think they, they, they took them by surprise. And then they went down. Kimmich gives them life. And then, to be honest, then Andre Kramerich happened. And I know he, always, he, he scored two at the end. He did everything before that. He was putting his, his the ball to, to Kuna on the wing. He was he – was, he was very active in the, in, the, in, the, in the entire facet of the game. And then he gets those two strikes at the end, which were deserved because of how well he played up to that point. But I think he was just having one of those games and Bayern Munich couldn't figure it out. And I think the biggest – this is the big thing with Bayern Munich. Their, their defense is very attacking-minded because you have Davies, you have Kimmich. I think Kimmich is world-class. I think he does both, but that's the only one. And they have, they have Alaba and, and then some other choices, but – None that are convincing enough where when you're in a Champions League tough game against, I, I, I don't know, Man City or a Liverpool or a PSG, for example, or Atletico, one of the Spanish teams, that's where they're going to struggle because they're going to score against everybody um, just because they're loaded. They're loaded across the board. But defensively, I don't love them as much. I actually I – know, I know how good Davis is going forward. I would like him to not go with forward as much. Because this is this is this is you become a secret weapon when you can go forward and defend. If he can learn defensive, you know, stuff and work on that part of his game, and he'll obviously go forward a bunch as well. But but defensively, I thought it was just a little chaotic. And once once it looked grim, I, I wouldn't say they gave up, but it didn't seem like they had that burning uh, aggression to go after it because. They, I felt like they, they thought that their talent alone was going to propel them to at least a point. And then, yeah, but bottom line, it's inexcusable. You lose 4-1. Hoffenheim's a good team that's going to be in the Champions League race, but you lose that 2-1. You don't lose it 4-1. Conceding 2 at the end like that is inexcusable. Um, I know Norrie's fantastic, but he's got to do better with, with some of those. And I, I know some of those goals were hard to say, but 
just as it just collectively they had to do much better just i don't know i don't know what happened it's just one of those things they they hit him in the mouth and it's going to be interesting how they respond to that because if they don't respond to that the way i'm expecting them Dorman could creep into this thing and i know i think byron will, will probably win it but Dorman, i think Dorman's is going to give him trouble this year that's just my, my my thought and i know they lost today but just on the buildup of their squad they really could push some media pressure and Dor Dorman usually choke but they have enough in that team to do something and Bayern just late at night today and I'm not sure exactly what happened but they have to respond in a, in a better way than, than that. You know, I love the fact that you mentioned Dortmund in the title race because I usually never have faith in them but in years past they've had not very convincing forwards like I know yeah. that Schwai had a great season at Dortmund. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the one from Valencia, Paco Alcacer, he had yeah. a great season as well. But Holland, while he may not be as good as people are, are believing him to be, he genuinely convinces me. He, like, at least good enough to win the title uh, mm -hmm. in terms of actually being able to perform. Right. Maybe not world or class yet. No, 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 no. It's not <laughs> but this team, especially with Witzel, Who's an underrated piece, in my opinion, in that team? Yeah. And Delaney. Oh, they, they um, uh, Julian Brandt. Yeah. Is a big um, one. Is a huge one. Last from from basically the from uh, from the break to the rest of the last season, he was the best player. Not he's not not even close. Yeah. Now, they have interchangeable pieces that could. If only I wish Dortmund actually prioritized the league. They never do. They always try to get. The China, uh, sorry, Champions League. Mm -hmm. Re, like they try to relive 2013. They try to get that surprise season. It just never really works out. Like last season against PSG, mm -hmm. they were knocked out. And the season prior, I believe 2019, who did they lose to? Tottenham. It's just Dortmund in the Champions League haven't seen much success recently. I, I wouldn't even consider them a, a contender. I, I never do. Mm -hmm. But if they prioritize the league and they treat it like each game was worth you know, a Champions League win, you know, that kind of mentality. Yeah. They might actually be able to do it this year. They have they have players that are not that injury prone, minus Royce, who is probably the textbook definition of injury prone. But aside from yeah. that, they have a good squad and they're growing. It's just a shame that they lost Hakimi. That's the one thing that makes me think my, maybe Byron will just win it again because he was pivotal in their team. Yeah. Uh, the thing about this is I think this season Dortmund has the best chance but I think RB Leipzig will be the team who will dethrone Bayern. If, okay, if, if this season, do, if, if Dortmund don't win this season, if Dortmund win this season, then whatever. But I've said this for a couple of years. We had this conversation um, on my other show at the very beginning of the, the Bundesliga restart. And we were basically asking the question, obviously we knew Dortmund was, or sorry, Bayern was going to win last year. It was just, it was inevitable. Which team is the most likely to dethrone them? And I know they have Holland. I know they have Sancho. I know they have Brandt. They're loaded. But if, if you just look at the way that RB Leipzig build their team, they're going to be much more likely to get a piece that's going to push them over the top. And I don't think it happens this year. But if, I, if I'm just going to make an outlandish prediction, I would say Bayern probably just holds on to it unless Dortmund upset them. And then RB Leipzig win an next year. And I think RB Leipzig want to win. At, they want to win on all fronts. They have one of the best, uh, one of the most underrated managers in the world. I think you can argue it. There's an argument for he's in the between five and seven. Um, and um, I just think the stability they have there. I look for Paulson to have a breakout year because he's a player that was sort of sidelined because of um, of Werner being there for those years. But um, he's he's big, strong, physical, really, really dynamic in the air and all the things. So so I think. Just, just to clarify, I think Dorman has the best chance to upset them this year. But I think if you're if you're gonna go long term speaking, which team is the most likely to take the title from Bayern? I think it's actually RB Leipzig because of the way they're building their team. Even though I think Dortmund has a stronger team this year, Holland could explode, and Sanchez could explode, and they could win it. But I I just trust going because if you notice, RB Leipzig doesn't choke in the title race. They're either they either aren't in it and then have a late push to the end and fall short, or they just keep pushing and Bayern's just better. Dortmund always is in a title race. They come through and then 
oh, it looks like, oh, we're going to win the league now. And then they choke and whole thing collapses. And this has happened at least three of the last five years. Last year, they should have won it. The year before, probably not. The year before that. The Angelotti year, they should have won it. Um, and then last year, they should have won it. So um, it, it's, it's, just, it's just really difficult. But I, I have a hard time putting my faith in Dortmund. But I'm trying this year because I criticized Holland all last year because all his goals came from the bottom, the bottom uh, eight teams. Um, if you just look at the numbers, um, Schalke was, he scored against Schalke when they were in sixth, but they weren't, they didn't finish in sixth, so it doesn't count. And he scored, the, the Champions League is excellent. Scored against PSG, scored against Liverpool multiple times. Um, but I just think Sanchez, sorry, Sancho and Holland are the key to this. If they can get going, then maybe they have a chance, but it's just hard to me. I have, I've put faith in them so many different years that I, I, it's just hard for me to do it. <laughs> I like the way you mentioned RB Leipzig because what prior we mentioned how they got to the semifinals with Al Werner. Yeah. And so their system, they'd be able to replace players with not ease, but like it would be much more, uh, you could see them replacing a player. Unlike Barcelona replacing Messi or like Chelsea replacing Hazard. It was yeah. like, wow, what do we do now? With Leipzig, if they lose Sabitzer, there are players that fit that position perfectly. Yeah, they don't even care that he's gone. Exactly. Werner, one of the most, how much was he, 50 million? Uh, six, 55 to 60, something like that. Possibly, like a huge transfer. Much of their identity yeah. rested on the shoulders of Werner. But their success did not rest on the shoulders of Werner. Yeah. And I know the they got four game. points for the first two games. That's not bad. They won that. I, I saw the first game that they played, at least the second half of that game, where it was false and had a great game. And then they they still have that, that left back from um, who was on loan from from City last year. Was it Angelino? Yeah, he's he's excellent. I mean, yeah. they got a good team. They got a great coach. Um, and I, you know, I don't think they get they care about Warner anymore. Um, I don't think he's. The, this is the problem with 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 deciding not to play in the Champions League the last year. It you're not going to be revered in the same way now. I mean, if they would have won the, the Champions League, I don't think they should, I don't think they, I don't think he deserved to, to have a winner's medal because I, he was technically still eligible. They're, they're moved on. The second he was gone, they moved on. And maybe, and this is, this is just a theory. I'm not saying I feel this necessarily. They actually looked a little bit better without him. And I'm not saying they're better without him because the t stats would tell me otherwise, but they made a Champions League semifinal and they weren't uh, – who they play? Uh, PSG uh, – Bayern, right? They played against PSG and lost 3-0, but they were set pieces. They lost to. Yeah. Again, so it wasn't a horrible performance. RB likes to play well in that game. It was goalkeeping mistakes that mo mostly led through. And, and I remember Di Maria being especially good in that game. But um, – so, again, they, and they, they beat Atletico Madrid, who has, who has my favorite young player in the whole world, um, who changed that game, bring – he comes in, does what he needs to do, wins the penalty scores, and now it's all tied up. And then at the end, Leipzig find a way to win the game. And um, it's just a testament to, to what they're building there. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, and, you know, it, this is only the beginning of that because I think they're going to get better and better and better. And they can, they, can, they can lose somebody and figure out quite easily. They always get these bargain deals. They got um, Danny Almo from, uh, from Zagreb for like $10 million. I mean, if he hit the market, now he'd be like 30-plus. So it's, it's, it's just attacking stuff attacking. like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. A under-23 Spanish attacking midfielder with an eye for goal. Yeah. That just sounds like 30 million right there. Yeah. 10, uh, I mean, no, but 30 million just to get to the table. Yeah. Like I said, it's like, okay, we'll give you 30-ish. All right, we can have a conversation. It, like, <laughs> that, that's the floor of what you – I'm not, I'm not sure he's a 50 million player yet. Well, but no. anywhere between 30 and 45 is his value. They got him for, I don't know, like 10, 15. It was, it was very cheap and uh, scores in the Champions League semifinals or quarterfinals. So it's just like, uh, it's just like one of those things. It's just, I just have faith in them. I really think that I know what they're doing. And also not to mention, they did make that title challenge in 2017. And I, I like, I appreciate the way you described it because in that campaign, they led some weeks but they didn't choke. It's not like they had an indestructible lead where it's like 10, 15 points. Yeah. Their leads were at max eight to seven points, if ever, over Bayern. And that I was thought... probably because of games in hand. Right. Then Bayern, 2016, 17, if I believe, that was the Real Madrid 
scandal uh, quarterfinal. That, that was one of the greatest. No, sorry, not one of the greatest, but like that was that was the talking, season where Bayern, I was talking about the offside party. Yeah, I was, I was talking about the Ronaldo hat trick with offsides, with the two offsides. Yeah. Um, that was that was a season where Bayern were actually really good. It's just they got unfortunate in the yeah. Champions League. And I think I think Real Madrid was the better team of the two, but those two things that happen are very unfortunate because they probably would have gone through and they might have won the Champions League. You just don't and know. Honestly, in 2018, I don't know how Bayern didn't win the Champions League. That yeah. second leg was the most terrifying attack on Real Madrid's goal I'd seen in the whole yeah. year. And they then, were the most. Right. And then here's the funny thing. Real Madrid uh, beat Atletico in the semifinal. That's the year you're talking about, right? He had the, they, they went up 3-0. It was a, it was a, it was a Ronaldo. I think he yeah. had two, two of three or something like that. And then the second, yeah, in the second leg of the Atletico Madrid, Atletico Madrid almost beat them. So yeah. that shows you, yes, player for player, they were better. But as a, like, just as a collective team, Bayern has to feel like they should have, because of the circumstances, that they would have had a great chance to, to go through. Um, yeah. So it, it's difficult, but it's just like, German football is funny in that way, where, you know, they never choked. They, they, they never choked, but they had moments where, where they probably could have done better, but they, it wasn't like Dortmund, where they, like, they, like, think they won the league at, in February, and then they, it, the whole thing collapsed. Or all they have to do, like, this is, this is why Dortmund choked last year. They shouldn't have let him back. They should, it should, they should have blitzed the rest of the league, but um, they lose one game to Bayern Munich. You, all you had to do was beat them once at home. And I know there's no fans in the stadium, but still, if they would have got anything from that game, they would have won the league. I think so. Because Bayern, it would have psychologically messed with them, and they would have dropped points in one of the other games where it would allow Dorman to propel them. But again, Dorman doesn't – and this is the thing I say with Juventus all the time is they, that club has winning intangibles. They know how to do it. They can, they can be ugly, but they win it. Um, and, and I'm not a huge fan of that team, but, you know, you, you respect. Where Dortmund's the opposite. They have all they have everything you need to win a title, but they yeah. don't have winning intangibles. They don't know how to do it because no one on that team has done it. So it's just like – You know what it reminds me of? It reminds know. me of the Rockets against the Warriors of 2018. Yeah. Where, like, the Rockets were probably better than the Warriors in that series, but the yeah. Warriors just had that winning gene that yeah. took them forward. And the Rockets – Number one seed. I know it's, it detracts from soccer here yeah. and football, but yeah. it's just a perfect analogy. It's like the other team has everything you need to win the game. There's just this ominous, miscellaneous factor that contributes to the bigger picture. And I feel like that's that's what makes great teams great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Bayern will win, and you'll be like, "Wow, that was so simple. Any team can do it." But no, at the biggest stage, not anyone and not anyone can do it. Yeah, and, and I know I know there's a lot of teams that have winning intangibles. But I always think of Juve because, and here's the reason why: they can play an ugly game and get something. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the game too much today, just because I'm doing it on my other one. But that's winning intangible is how that happens. You know what I mean? You don't. They, they can be outplayed for 90 minutes, and when I mean 90 minutes, Roma were better for every minute of the whole game, and they get a point. And I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm happy with the point, but at the same time, the reason they're able to come through in these moments is because they're winning a chance, especially Ronaldo. And oh. look, look, here's the thing about Ronaldo now. And and watching him the last two games, I finally figured it out. So last year it was like inconsistency, awesome inconsistency. So it was it was like up and down. Now he doesn't play like this is this is really messed up, but this is how he is right now. He doesn't play well for like for most of the game, and then he has that moment, and boom, there you go. Because look, if like look, um Roger Ibanez, he he looked like he was like Fabio Cannavaro something against Ronaldo. He made him like non-existent in the attack. And then, you know, but then he has that moment where the ball comes in and then Ronaldo just comes up there, gets the header and, and puts it past a Marante. But so, so stuff like that where Ronaldo in this time of his career, he's not, look, and I love Ronaldo, his Real Madrid. And I, I feel like I keep, need to keep saying that because I'm, I'm, I've been critical. So I just had to justify that just a little more. I was a, like Ronaldo, Real Madrid Ronaldo was a problem. If Real Madrid, Real Madrid Ronaldo came to Juventus, you know, four years ago, I've been terrified. I would have said, "Uh oh." <laughs> See what I mean? So, but now, now, like Ronaldo is playing, he's playing poorly most of the game, but he'll come up in the in the moment where he needs to come up with, and that's what that's the winning intangible. That's like the definition of that. Like, 
against Sampdoria, oh god, it was it was just bad. And then he comes up, he gets the goal against Roma. It was it was even worse. And then he comes up and get goal. And I think that's what's gonna it's gonna be like that for most of the season. And Ronaldo will have games where he's he's great for like the whole ninety, but it's just not gonna happen all the time. So when he's not playing well, he's but he's gonna he knows how to get those moments where he can seduce people to thinking that he still is, you know, the, the, that guy when he's not, but you know, it's, it's just, it's just like, it, it's a very special quality that I don't think you, that it can teach in someone. You either, it's, it's like I said, I always say, you have it or you don't. And it's, it, that's all you need to know. It's, and so I think when it comes to, to, to just in the winning intangibles argument, players like him know how to get it done in those moments where they don't need to play well the whole game. They don't need to even have those dominating performances because you can look at the score sheet and say, uh, Ronaldo was fantastic. No, he wasn't. So, so it's just like, but he has that moment. And this is what I, this is what I love about Ronaldo so much, is that he can find that place in that game in the right moment comes through. You know, good night. Because it, so many times, and not just Ronaldo, there's other players who do that so well. But teams like Juventus and and Bayern Munich, and um, I guess not not City, but uh, like Liverpool to a certain extent. Late, not not long term, but just recently, um, P, PSG. You know, not PSG. That was a bad example. But you, you know what I mean. Just just some of these historical teams who know how to get it done. Um, where again, teams like PSG, Dortmund, um, City just don't have the winning intangibles, which is why, you know, I don't know. It's always I guess to a certain extent, like Fergie time, Man United, where it's like they were the worst. They weren't the best team, but they still get the result because they find right. the moment to get it. The way I the way I look at it is ugly games where they shouldn't win and they do it anyways. Like there's so many games where where with, with several different teams that that operate like this, and not a lot of teams have this quality. The ones who do are always winning. You notice that people think that our, the the Syria and Bundesliga are farmer leagues because we have the same champions. Why do we have the same champions? Because they have winning intangibles. They know how to win. Where the rest of the league is trying to figure it out on the fly. If, if, if like Napoli or Roma or any of these other teams had winning intangibles, Juve would probably won six in a row, not ten, not nine. Where same with Bayern. Bayern's won, I think, eight in a row now. Um, if, if, if Dortmund has winning intangibles, they don't win eight in a row. Where, and this is the problem, this is, this is one people give me a hard time for the Premier League. Um, like, it's just like the reason, the reason that they, they have stuff there is they have a few teams with winning intangibles. So sometimes it changes the guard of the, the top. So it's just it's just one of those things where it's just I don't. It's hard to explain, but you either have it or you don't, and some teams don't. And the problem is being a good team that doesn't have it is down the stretch in big moments. So Inter Milan last year had two cracks at Juventus. They let one man ruin it for them both times. Dybala has those moments in both those games. That's the title. Game over. That. Juve didn't win it because they won, you know, whatever amount of games. They won the title because they won two games. Beat Inter twice, good night. I mean, so that's the type of mentality that I think a lot of these – the teams that aren't at that level struggle with, and that's why sometimes there's, you know, there's there's yeah. repeat champions. You're absolutely right. Inter finished one point behind that Juventus team. Yeah, and I, and I know was- – right. I know – so I don't mean to cut you off. Tech, like in, in technically speaking, they finished second. In reality, they finished like third, but but it's just like that's what it came down to: two Dybala moments, and it, he didn't. Dybala was great in both those games. He didn't. He didn't need to do that. He needs needed two moments, and the second Inter like the second Inter lost the second game, it was over. They knew it was over, and it was it was only a couple points. And again, Juve, Juve, and um, and Juventus. Dybala has moments. They, they won one of those games, the important one. Or I'm not sure they won. They, they, they got they got an important point off last year. They might I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But again, against all these teams that were fighting and fighting and fighting for with Juve, I mean, again, yet, yet last year was just the year of Dybala. But Dybala would always have these moments against these teams, and that's the difference between winning the title and not winning the title. Inter was one point off them. Lazio was not that many points off them either. So it's just – it's hard to find those things. So when you have a player that or a team that does that, it's why it's so difficult to dethrone them. Because people are pinging Juve again, because there's no reason why they wouldn't win. Um, I didn't pick them, but you, you get what I'm saying though. So it's, it's just like, it's like one of those things. It's just crazy. 
I feel like Barcelona at home in the Champions League prior to this season had that winning intangible where it's yes. like they could always win no matter what. Yeah. And on the off chance that they didn't have it, like in 2012 against Chelsea or in 2017 when they couldn't score against Juventus, bar those very intermittent performances, they usually got the wins at the new camp. Do you think that's something they've lost as a result of the Bayern game? Yeah. Not, no, not just because of the Bayern, just because of the last three years. This is the heart, this is the heartbreaking thing about Barca. And, and look, Roma's always my number one team. I have so much respect and admiration for Cruyff. It's always I ask, and I've always liked Barcelona. And don't get me wrong, when Ronaldo was kicking it with with um, Real Madrid and he was playing at that level. I want so I, I'm not like when it comes to La Liga, I like Real Madrid and Barcelona. I know that I'm not supposed to, but for different reasons. But I always loved the Barcelona, the Pep Barcelona is probably one of my favorite teams to watch. Um, especially when they did the documentary and they really highlight this, this, and this. It's, it's very interesting. But um, the reason, the reason this is, they're, they're gotten away from Cruyff. The, all his philosophy, this is, this is the most, this is like the biggest slap in the face to the, the history of this club. They've gotten away from the Cruyff stuff where it was about, you know, it wasn't about getting the biggest talent. It was about ball possession. It was about, it was about dictation. It was about all this stuff and playing the football the right way. If we're going to be, if we're going to win, we're going to win playing this way. We're not just going to buy a bunch of players and do this. They've gone the total opposite way. Not only that, they're buying Coutinho when they didn't need to. They bought Dembele when it wasn't necessary. They're buying Griezmann when it didn't make sense. So it's just like they're just going for the name brand stuff and um, what you call kind of a boys club now where it's, it's just, it's being run so poorly. And no, I mean, since Pep's Barcelona, yeah, since Pep's Barcelona, there's been no Cruyffian um, elements to a little bit of the MSN uh, era, just a little bit though. And now they have none of it. They 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 play exactly, they play the style of football that would make Cruyff the most infuriating. So he would be so angry of the way that Barcelona has become. So they're they're still a massive club, but they're becoming one of these teams that just doesn't have the it. And they used to always have it. And they just don't. And yes, it's great that they beat, I don't know who they played, Villarreal, what, four or five mil, whatever. But I just don't, this is what it comes down to. And I didn't mean to segue into this. I think Atletico Madrid is going to win the, win the league this year. Um, I just, I wrote an article last a few days ago about this, uh, about why signing Suarez is going to be the, the knockout punch. So Real Madrid is in dysfunction. Um, a little bit, just because no hazard. I mean, the hazard thing hasn't worked out. They don't have that that uh, key piece, and and they they struggled the first two games. So it's not it's not very convincing so far. Then you have Barcelona. With, you still have the best player in the world. Uh, you still have good pieces there, but it's going through transition. And then with Atletico Madrid, they needed one thing. That's all. They, they needed one thing ahead of this whole thing. And again, no winning intangibles over all those two teams, at least in this in this little last year and a half. Um, and the only thing they needed was someone who knows how to win, who can help Raphael Leal, or not Raphael, I'm sorry, Jao Felix. Um, and Jao Felix Ture looked tremendous. I mean, he looks like he's going to bag a 20 to 30 goal season. Suarez comes on in the 70th minute to uh, an assist in two goals in 20 minutes. So they need, they, now they have that guy that, that was going to help Felix grow as a player and also capable of a 20 goal season. With, if that happens, how is anyone going to stop them? And I really do genuinely think that they're going to win the league. The second they signed him, it was it was a foregone conclusion because now they have other aspects to it. But I don't know. Barcelona has always trailed in terms of you know winning intangibles and all that. It's just they just don't have that thing anymore, which is why it's Atletico Madrid is is potentially going to be become has the opportunity to be the the big the king of Spain, at least for the next couple of years, based on how the other teams are doing. If one of them signs Mbappe, all bets are off. But at, the, at this moment, based on the buildup of the team, is Atletico Madrid is clearly the, the dominant force just in terms of the, um, the, the way the team's constructed. You bring up a massive point, because now that I think about it, they have the best goalkeeper in the world, or maybe top three goalkeepers in the world. Number one. Know. Number one. Yeah. <laughs> then you have young fullbacks. Trippier, maybe Trippier or not, but like, Young midfield with Saul, mm. who's a general. He has got the experience of a 30-year-old, but he's still in his mid-20s. Correra is there, too. 
Pereira too. Yeah. And then you have Marcos Llorente, who is just box to box. Like I don't even know what he is anymore. He's just every- he he never he like never scores, but when he does, it's always in a dramatic way. <laughs> And he's not a person we're expecting to score, but he's been tremendous. They still have Thomas uh, part three in the the midfield. I don't know if he's going to be there at the end of the season. I just don't know because everybody wants him. And then they have Rafael Leal, Diego Costa, Luis Suarez. You can play with a front three if you want. I mean, that's how good they are. I mean, I think Lafayette – sorry, no, I keep mixing up the name. Felix is is going to be the the key point, and I think they're going to make him the key point. Because if Suarez is your second best player, you're in trouble. <laughs> because he scored, he has one goal and two assists in one game, and he only played 20 minutes. What's going to happen when he plays 90 minutes? <laughs> Not to mention, this is crazy, man. Like, this is what I mean. This is, this is actually going to tie in perfectly, full circle, to the Werner argument. Where it's like, you've taken Suarez out of Barcelona, but he's still in Spain. And he's just been doing it. It's as if he never left Spain. Whereas with Werner, it's like he went from one league to a completely new one. And so that's why we're seeing a dip in his performance. I think for Suarez, there's going to be no dip in performance. And if it is, it's due to age. It's not due to the team change. I think, he's going, I think he's going to go up. I think he can get 30 this year. I really do. Because he could prioritize him. There Suarez, is no else. Yeah. we talked about this on my show a few, uh, several weeks ago about why Juventus should sign Jack over, over Suarez because of his link-up play. And he does, he's not a primary goal scorer. Suarez is a primary goal scorer with incredible passing ability. So in this setup, it doesn't work with Juventus because of the two, the ball and Ronaldo, but, but in this setup, you have, you just have your, your young player right there. You feed him and then you can score yourself. So it's just like the avalanche of goals that could come from this is incredible. And, and just the ball work that um, Felix was doing today and they'll be able to pin off each other. And this is, this, is, this is how Felix is going to get to the next level. Playing with Suarez for the next two years is going to get him to a class where he belongs. And Mbappe is the, 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 the main superstar, at least at this moment. But again, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing not out of 10 people don't agree with this. In terms of the ceiling of Felix and the ceiling of Mbappe, I know Mbappe is more talented. But the, if, if, you, if you take the highest level that's, that Felix can achieve and the highest level Mbappe can achieve, I think Felix's ceiling is just a little higher. And if you, if you, he hasn't even touched the iceberg of what he can capable of. And Suarez is going to help him with that. They have a great coach. They have a great goalkeeper. Like, where's, where's, where's the gap? Where's, like, where's the crack in the foundation? I don't see one. It, it's going to come down to the whole back. It's going to come back to this thing again, the winning intangible. If they got it, they won the league. If they don't, they won't. But it, this is their best time to ever do it. I, I don't. There's not going to be a better opportunity because Real Madrid's in dysfunction. I don't care what you said. Those two performances. If you're a Real Madrid fan, you can't be happy with the way the team has played. Barcelona, you have so many problems right now that you might win it just because Messi is going to be so pissed off. But it, everything goes into Atletico Madrid's corner just because. And this is the best part. The rest of La Liga isn't what it used to be anymore. Those. It's basically those three, and that's it. So they, all they have to do is pick up the points against the teams they're supposed to and win the big games. And Suarez performs in big games. And Laf- uh, Felix has performed in big games too. So I don't know. But it's just – it's again, it's going to come down to winning in tangible. And I, I think they're going to win it. I really do. Um, one, uh, one last final point. Do you ever – like when you said you liked Real Madrid and Barcelona, I – I kind of feel like I've come to admire Barcelona because of their greatness. And the more I've matured, the more I've come to the acceptance that you don't have to hate a team just because they are against your favorite team. And so do you think that, well, this is a bit of a segue here, but like when you said Suarez had passing ability, and that's something that I see in Benzema and like attacks in Spain, like, Mm -hmm. do you think that, like admiration for the rival, like admiration for Barcelona style, is something that could be integrated into like Real Madrid? Or do you think that they've already done that? Like, do you think Real Madrid ever said, wow, Barca just won the treble. What did they do? Let's try that. Do you think they ever did that? Or do teams, should they never break personality and tradition? No, I think some teams do it. I guarantee Real Madrid doesn't do it. I guarantee Barcelona doesn't. Barcelona might. Real Madrid's um, personnel strike me as a bunch of babies. They'll never, they won't even, 50 years from now, they won't even acknowledge that Pep's Barcelona was a great team. They'll find some segue of why this this happened, this happened. If it wasn't for this, we would have won those championships too. 
I'll say this though, because this is a good example. I'm a Lazio, I'm sorry, I'm a Roma fan. I, Lazio, we just don't, we don't get on, all right? So it's my, my whole life, it, that's just been the, 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 the lesson that's, that's been drilled into my head. I, I'm very, I would say, uh, very aggressively against Lazio, just as a general team. But, um, but, you know, all Roma fans are that way. All Lazio fans are the same way about Roma. We feel that energy about, about us. They feel that energy. We And we're going to, you know, vice versa. Um, I, I hated this, but I loved watching them last year. I thought they were absolutely incredible to watch. And it's really funny because I don't associate um, hatred in that way a little bit, but a little bit because I'm a Roma fan. But I become the defender on social media of Kiro Mumble because I feel like people are like he can't like when people say that he can't do it in another league, it's absolute like BS. He you could put him in any team and he would be probably your leading striker. Um, this season, because they didn't win anything, Ballon d'Or is off the table, that sort of thing. But but Kiro Mobley is someone I respect. I, I respect Lazio's team and the way they play. They play beautiful football. Um, I don't like their manager at all, but but again. I'm a Roma fan. I, I, it takes no joy in me saying anything positive about them. And again, I talk about Lazari all the time. I just really think he's that good. Um, so I think it's, it's very possible for a, t- a team or a player or whoever, however you feel about this team or this team, to have admiration for someone. I can be in this, on this side of the argument, but also say this team is absolutely fantastic. And if, if, look, if Lazio win the title, I'm never going to say congratulations. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disappear into my cave. But, you know, I can I can watch them play football and say this is a great team, but at the same time, um, I think a lot of people probably view it that way, where there's teams that you may not be fond of but you respect, and I always respected Barcelona also in the same way. I'm like I don't I don't I never picked a side, um, but at the same time, you would think that at least some teams view it that way, and I think most teams do, but Real Madrid Barcelona is a little different because they have a very petty relationship where one team wins and then the other person, the other team ha- comes up with a statement about if this, 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 then w- this would happen. Or, um, you know, I would rather win one title with, with this than 10 titles with you. that sort of thing. But I think, I think it's good for football to have admiration for your rivals. You can hate them and trust me, I do, but I can still say that's beautiful football. <laughs> I agree. And like the more, the more we learn, the more we come to admire. And I feel like football is just, it's just more than just a sport. It combines intuition with strategy and passion and emotion. And I feel like that's that's definitely something to look forward to to next week's podcast. Don't you agree, Elliot? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I just love these conversations just because we're asking, we're talking about the questions that nobody wants to ask or afraid to ask. Because yeah. nobody wants to say positive things about the rival. But subconsciously, you, you are admired by beautiful football. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll never say it, but I'm sure Lazio fans really enjoyed the Roma team that scored 125 goals with Jekko, Sala, and El Shirai, Parati, all those guys. So, and again, we feel, I think a lot of Roma fans subconsciously feel the same way. I'm different. I, I, um, I like Immobile. It's hard not to. I think he's a great player. I, I, won't, I won't buy his jersey or anything like that, but I, I think, um, I think he's, he's underrated rather than overrated. And I think a lot of people just in the, in the Roma community feel that way. But again, I, I, had, I had made this, and this is my last point I'll make on this, is, is the Ronaldo Mobley thing, they call it the penalty competition from last year. Penalty, <laughs> the penalty, this is the thing about penalties. They're not valued the same. If you, if you score penalties and you're, doing, you're just scoring goals and you're not creating for your team, it's not as valuable. So you can say, okay, you scored 34 goals, let's minus that by the 12 penalties. I've then it comes out to this. So, but so you get. I feel like you can do that for a, like that. But if you're creating, if so, Mobley scores penalties, but he's doing way more than that. And he gets fouled. So, I don't care if he had 20 penalties. He's still you can see in creation with with his build up and stuff like that. And both had great seasons. But the reason I favor Mobley is because he was doing he was doing all the things that DiBala was doing for Ronaldo. So Ronaldo wasn't doing that because someone else was doing it for him. Where Immobile was, and I'm not saying he's the most creative because he has loose help. He has Alberto over there and stuff and, and Savage, but he, he, there was some creation with the way he plays where Ronaldo was, was basically 
again, but this is just the way Ronaldo plays. So I don't blame that on him. Is give me the ball and I'm gonna, I'm gonna strike it from where, I, where I'm comfortable with it. So it's just like it's just like one of those things. You know what I mean? I have the perfect I have the perfect two ideas for the next podcast. Okay. I will save them. But if you remember the Tottenham Juventus tie in the round of 16, 2018. Do you yeah, remember yeah, how, of course, of course. how dynamic? Yeah, I have so much I want to say, but I'm going to reserve it because this okay. genuinely, I'm actually going to make a graphic for it. Douglas Costa made me think, wow, he's like a new bail in a certain sense of like yeah. the pace of in that game. But I'll, I'll reserve it because I know we'll have ideas. And also, are you available on Wednesday by any chance? Or should um, we reserve it until Sunday? Oh, when, um, I, have to, I have to check. Yeah. Uh, it, right. de- it depends on timing. Yeah. But, um, but man, these these conversations they really do go deep. And the funny thing is, like today it was more uh, modern than it was in the in the past. Yeah, and, like, I, and that's, that's just my our circle. <laughs> our circle is like endlessly our boundaries of football history. Man, like it it does not have a limit. That's what I love right. the most. Because there are certain people where I mention Eto, they do not know what I'm talking about. I mentioned right. David Villa, they don't know. I mentioned let's see who who was in between that era. Alexis Sanchez, they wouldn't know. Yeah. As soon as I mentioned Luis Suarez, oh yeah, they know everything. Right. But just a little bit earlier, they don't know anything. I think and it's partially the social media age too. I, where this this is the problem I have with the generation. Um, you probably know him, uh, Remo Fruler from Atlanta. He was one of the best eleven players. Not he was good last year, but wasn't was the year before he was best eleven players, and he had like three goals. Where <laughs> you look at you look at. People, people who love Ronaldo and Messi and, and those guys will look at the goals, the, the score sheet for a game and they say, oh, Ronaldo scored twice. I'm going to post he was at – Ronaldo was absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> and, and that doesn't mean it's actually the truth because you can be – you can have a shocker and you get on moments where the, people were compl- – I couldn't believe it actually because I thought last year <laughs> – last year and, and Mobley deserves some credit, Papa Gomez deserves some, but I thought – that the MVP for Serie A last season should have been um, unanimous. I thought it was DiPaolo was clearly because of all the other contributing factors that happens if he doesn't exist in this team. So, and he had, and I was saying that I was, I, I first said it when he was, he had, he had four goals and one assist or something. That's the first time I said it and people went crazy, but it's just, it's, it's more than goals and assists. And I think the new generation needs to be taught that it's more than goals and assists. They're so accustomed to the Ronaldo Messi goal scoring show that they ignore people like Fruler, who, you know, someone like that, like Mer- Lorente from Atletico, who aren't scoring a bunch of goals, but they're doing so many of the other things. You can't base everything you see based on goals and assists. Exactly. To a certain extent, I feel like the, the Luka Modric Ballon d'Or was kind of like a uh, aim in that direction only. Yeah. It was a little bit misguided, but I, I do appreciate that actually. Like Modric winning the Ballon d'Or, even yeah, if it I, did hinder. Right. This is this is what I always said. The question is like, people, did he deserve it? Does he deserve it? Yes, he deserved it. Was he the most deserving? No, he was not. Yes. So, so it's, 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 it's a different way of looking at it. And I mean, you have to feel happy. This this was a kid of war who took his team to the World Cup final. One with with Real Madrid. Look, I would have given it to Messi. I think most people would have done the same. I don't mind that he's on there because that was that was an important Ballon d'Or, not because he was the most deserving for it, but because of the narrative around that changes because he won the Ballon d'Or with with one or two goals. So um, yeah, so it's just stuff like that, and and you know it, it, it's whatever. You know what I mean? Because it's you know it depends on how you evaluate it. Um, and just ter- in terms of if what are you looking for when you and I we should do a whole podcast about what the Ballon d'Or, what the qualifications yeah. for for it should be because I have a lot of stuff because there was a year um I'm not saying he should have won it. Ribery? No, I, uh, I was gonna say Jacko in in 2017, right. the the year the the record breaking Roma year. I'm not saying he should have won it. He should have been a top five in that year because of everything he was doing for that club. And Ribery's a good one. Schneider, I still would have given it to Messi in the Schneider year, but Schneider's another one. Um, you can talk about Zidane some years should have won it. There's uh, Van Dyke again, not, not, I would have voted for Messi in there too, but ones like that, ones where Maldini was robbed, ones where Totti was robbed, 
ones where um, Tyrion uh, Reed. Tyrion Reed was robbed. Um, so it's just like they were. They're so focused nowadays because the Messi Ronaldo era of goals and winning. And if you win an international trophy, it's going to be hard to, to trump that. So th I get that for that kind of stuff. But you you can win a Ballon d'Or with four goals. I just think you should. And I think that the narrative about this should change. I actually did an article about this when when uh, when uh, um, Modric won it. Not not yeah. attacking the fact that he'd won it. The attacking the fact of the the way that they, they conducted the ceremony and, and what they're looking for because that year. Messi got like fifth or something, and yeah, Varane yeah. and Griezmann got a, was ahead of them, just because they won the World Cup. So the th the thing is, I think it should be like this, and I, I'm not gonna give all my ammo away. Who was the best at football? Okay, let's now. So let's say, let's say there's two people that were both similar at football. And then you add what they'd won. Then you give it to the one with the most trophies. If I'm the if this guy's the best at football and no one compares then the trophies just go out the window. So I just think it's interesting. I think um, I'd really like a vote, to be honest, <laughs> um, just because I think it's being viewed the wrong way. And it's it, like Johan Cruyff said uh, back in the day, it's just a popularity contest of journalists voting for their friends. Um, yeah. So <laughs> but we will touch up on this next week because I did have a question and you're going to love it. Yeah. Mandzukic should still be at Juventus, in my opinion. He probably should still be in that attack. He would be very functional. Yeah. Um, because he's interchangeable on the left wing with Ronaldo. And he is more mature than what people give him credit for. Um, but either way, either way. Yeah. Um, we'll definitely save that for next week. Um, All right. But Elliot, it's been a pleasure speaking to you this week. And there's so much more that we have to talk about, especially with the hungry and the golden generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. And I think that we're going to do a lot of episodes on that sort of thing. Um, yeah. But I, I'm going to – I'm going to turn off now, but uh, thank, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. We'll see you next week. For sure. Thank you, guys. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, there it is. Hold on.